All right, now we want to ask what reagents would take us from this starting material to this product? Uh, well, let's start by numbering. Um, and I think I'm going to start by numbering this carbon here. I'm going to number this the number one carbon. Which of these carbons seems like the number one carbon? Yeah. I think a lot of people might have thought that this was the number one carbon. But the number one carbon here is tertiary. So our best guess that is that this is the number one carbon. It's only a guess, but our best guess is that this is the number one carbon. All right, and then we might call this two, three, and four. So we would have two, three, and four. But it seems like that. So we want to start with the number one here. OK. So what's the big change that's happening here? Well, the big change is that we have to get rid of the pi bond. We have to get rid of the pi bond and put this bromine in here. All right, so we do have to think back to those addition reactions that you learned about in the previous term. I don't know if you, how, how well you remember those. Do you remember any addition reaction that would add a bromine to a double bond? Uh, HBr. Good. Because it's just basically replacing the pi bond with the hydrogen, correct? Say that again? Because you're replacing the, the pi bond, the bond mm -hmm. that uh, makes up the pi bond, the, the sigma of the pi bond just goes to bond to hydrogen, correct? OK, yeah, that's right. OK, good. So that's good that you remember that. So let's see if we can also remember the mechanism. Let's try drawing the mechanism for what's going to happen here. I think we put in the HBr. So we have to start by drawing the HBr. And then we want to see if we can draw the mechanism for how the starting material will react with the HBr. Now we need to find uh, a nucleophile. Now we know that negative things tend to be nucleophiles. However, something that um, it would have been good to learn last term is that carbon-carbon pi bonds are also nucleophilic. Not only negative charges, but also carbon-carbon pi bonds are nucleophilic. You just kind of have to have that memorized, that carbon-carbon pi bonds are nucleophilic. Does that mean that they want to be at the head of an arrow or the tail of an arrow? Nucleophiles want to be at tails and donate electrons. So I'll put this pi bond at the tail. The reason why they're nucleophilic, remember a nucleophile is somebody who wants to put its uh, donate its electrons. Well, pi electrons are not as stable as sigma electrons. So the pi electrons would like to stop being pi electrons and form a sigma bond. So this would like to donate the pi electrons to form a sigma bond. Now we have to figure out somebody to put at the head. Um, well, should we put the hydrogen or the bromine at the head? Yeah, why does it make sense for the hydrogen to be at the head and not the bromine? Because the bromine is uh, pulling away the electrical charge. It's holding on to its electrons. It's making the hydrogen uh, ever so positive. Yeah, the key point was that last point you made. Remember, we want to focus on the charges. Electrophiles tend to be positive or delta positive. Well, this hydrogen is delta positive, so it's very reasonable for it to be at the head. And that's going to free up the electrons to go over here. So in general, who wants to be at tails? people with negative charges or delta negative. And who wants to be at heads? People with positive charges or delta positive. Now we just learned one exception. Carbon-carbon pi bonds don't have any charges, but they still like to be at tails. Uh, so that's an additional thing. Uh, but that's in addition to the fact that usually the charges tell us who goes at the head of the tail. All right, so now we have to see if we can draw the product from that step. Now, clearly, the pi bond is not going to exist between number one and number four anymore. Now, uh, I, I keep saying how the, the electron pushing arrows tell you exactly what bonds to form. But actually, here we're going to see the one deficiency in electron pushing arrows. This is the one type of electron pushing arrow that's ambiguous. It's not clear from this whether the number one is bonding to the hydrogen or the number four is bonding to the hydrogen. This is a deficiency in the notation. This type of arrow doesn't make it clear if the one or the four is bonding to the hydrogen. Well, we have to ask which of those makes more sense. Um, well, whoever bonds to the hydrogen, the other one will get the positive charge, right? Um, so for example, if the hydrogen ends up over here, that happened 
because the number one took these electrons and bonded with the hydrogen. Well, that would mean the number four lost the electrons. So it would have to end up positive. Or on the other hand, suppose it was the number four that took the electrons to bond to the hydrogen. Well, then it would be the number one that lost the electrons, and it would end up positive. But the number one's happier that way. Good. Because it can, it's, uh, has uh, substituents. Yeah, it's more substituted. We know we want to put the carbocation in a more substituted place. In fact, this is impossible because it's primary. Yeah. This can't happen at all. But even if, this was, um, even if this was secondary, it still wouldn't be good as tertiary. We want to put the positive charge in the most substituted place. So that's how we resolve the ambiguity in this electron pushing arrow. This is one of the key issues that you guys might have gone over when you learned about these reactions uh, previously. And now we have to review that a little bit. Have you ever learned about Markovnikov? Yeah, OK. So um, all right. So um, this is not going to happen. This is going to happen. And then the bromide will attack the nuclear block, or the uh, carbocation. Yeah. Good. Because the other product of this step that they didn't draw yet was the bromide. This step was very efficient. Not only did it form the carbocation, it also formed the bromide that's going to attack it. So let's draw the mechanism for that step. Now, we have to use bromide. It's not the same bromide as from here. So you have to draw the new Br minus that we formed. Just do this. This is the product. So we're done. By the way, when you're doing synthesis problems, the way to do a synthesis is write the starting material. First of all, you should hold your paper horizontally. You want to make your paper horizontal like this so you can put the starting material on the far left. And then you want to put the product on the far right. And then you make a great big arrow. And then you write all the intermediate steps kind of down below, like this. Because there might be two or three steps that it takes to go from here to here. So okay. this is the best way to work out a synthesis. And then the last step, you don't have to draw the product, because this is the product that we've already drawn. All right. Uh, so. All right, so the lesson here was, um, it looks like you probably should uh, review um, the additions you saw last term. Um, in the previous problem, we were trying to form a pi bond. But we knew we did that by elimination. But here we're trying to remove a pi bond. Well, the way you do that is by uh, addition. You learned a whole bunch of different types of additions last term. Um, this was one of the most important, uh, to add uh, a halogen. And um, this is that Markovnikov, where the bromine ends up on the more substituted carbon. And the mechanism explains that regiochemistry. Why do we end up on the more substituted carbon? Because that is the more uh, stabilized carbocation. All right. Uh, and again, I think it's really helpful here to be putting in the numbers okay. uh, when possible. 